millions of players, hundreds of thousands of tournaments. Now, just two players, one match, one prize, the Pro Tour title of Magic Origins. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night wherever you are around the world. Welcome to the final of Pro Tour Magic Origins. Rich Hagen sitting alongside Pro Tour historian Brian David Marshall and Hall of Famer Louis Scott Vargas waiting to see who will be our champion. Will it be this man, Jo Larsson of Sweden? He's been here before in the finals of a Pro Tour in Canada at Montreal, Gate Crash 2013, can he go one better? Or will it be this man, your player of the year for 2014, 2015, Mike Sigrist of the United States? Let's find out in the company of Brian David Marshall and Luis and BDM, who's the favorite here in this best of five? Yeah, I feel like Mike Sigris has the ability to go over the top of this red deck, but both of these decks have drawn hands that, you know, are going to let each deck do what they want to do. Both of them mulliganed to six, pushed a card to the bottom. Uh, you know, Joel Larson kept a hand with Lightning Berserker, a couple lands, a couple of Abbots, and you know what? Mike Sigris kept a hand with Ornithopter and Insole Artifact. Which apparently, Luis, if we've been paying attention, is quite good. It, it is, it is, especially if you have a second land, which Sigrist is currently lacking. Oh! But all is not lost. He has a Springleaf Drum, which allows him to get to two mana, and uh, e even though he has to wait an additional turn. Back we go to Larson, who had Abbot of Corral Keep on turn two. Third land into Exquisite Firecraft, your Ornithopter. Oh. A major victory for Ornithopters everywhere. It's a, it's a great play from, from Larson there. Sigurds can't cast any spells now. Yeah, that's similar to his Phyrexian Revoker on the Rattleclaw Mystic, you know, the other side of the table uh, last round. Another Abbot of Corral Keep uh, reveals Mountain, which Larson will therefore get to play that he can use straight away uh, to pump up his Lightning Berserker. And Sigurds in trouble here. Remember, they did both mulligan and push, so neither was super happy. And one thing red decks have always done is really punish opponents. There's Exquisite Firecraft, there's game one! <laughs> wow! <laughs> <laughs> that, that game took all of five turns in like two minutes. That, I, I've seen crack packs go more slowly than that. Well, every single one we've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> that was extraordinary. Exquisite We're even. Yeah. <laughs> we are gonna take a little breath and we'll be back in just a moment. Ignite your spark. Magic Origins is now available on Magic Online. Explore the new set by signing up for Magic Online at mtgo.com. Twenty-four players, one shot at immortality. Watch the best players in the world battle for the Magic World Championship starting Thursday, August 27th from PAX Prime in Seattle, Washington. This just in. The new Mulligan rule will not necessarily save you. <laughs> yeah. Well, save one of them. <laughs> Joel, Joel had didn't have anything that he needed in that hand. Like that hand, he had two lands, two creatures, and you know a burn spell. Like there wasn't much he was looking for. Sigrist really needed that second land. He really did, and he and he had the scry from his Mulligan, and he had the scry from his first land, which was a temple. Well, the players moments after starting game one are gearing up for game two. That means sideboard time. We have a maximum of four sideboarded games here. It's three out of five in the final. Here's Larson's. It's a very straightforward uh, in the sense there are only five cards to choose from. You have the Planeswalker, Chandra, Pyromaster, full set of both Eidolon of the Great Revel and Roast, three Sate of Fire Dancer, and a couple of Arc Lightning when you want to spread three damage around. Uh, Luis, your sense of what Yo Larson will do here in the final? He doesn't actually have a ton of great options. His main deck is already pretty good for this matchup, but yeah, some Arc Lightnings will, will likely come in. 
I can't really see a ton of these other cards. I mean, maybe he's tested the matchup and found that he likes Chandra, for example, as a way to ping things, but that just does not seem all that plausible to me. And even though Roast can kill an Ensoul artifacted creature, so often it's going to go on Ornithopter or Darksteel Citadel that I, I wouldn't even love that plan. Or even Hangerback Walker, <laughs> that makes it a 6-6. Six, six. So, Joel, Joel is a little underprepared for this matchup in terms of sideboard slots, but again, his main deck is pretty good for the matchup. You can't see something with Eidolon where you just like... You know, you're going to put him under such enormous pressure that, you know, doesn't get a chance to play some of the cards he wants to play later, or...? The, the problem is, this isn't exactly like a modern affinity deck where you're you're playing like six spells in the same turn. <laughs> it's more like you're trying to just get hit with one big threat, and Eidolon is not very good in that position. So that's what Larson's got to work with. Bracket, not an awful lot, close bracket. Let's go the other side of the table, put ourselves in Mike Sigris' shoes, um, which are currently belonging to our new player of the year. He has four counter spells in the form of Disdainful Stroke and a single negate. More burn from Rending Volley, the full set of Roast, because that card is super efficient. Three Seismic Rupture, and if you want more 1-1 Flyers to put your Ghostfire Blades and Insole Artifacts onto, Thought to Spy Network could do that for you. Uh, so what do we think here, gentlemen? I, I think you want to break out those brackets again. It doesn't feel like there's all, <laughs> all, uh, not. This is another case of not much in terms of their uh, the sideboard plan. I mean, is he going to bring in the Seismic Ruptures here? Yeah, I mean, seis Seismic Rupture is good. It's part of the reason I don't love Eidolon, even though it's probably worth bringing in. Is just Seismic Rupture is a card you can expect Sigurd to have in his deck. But other than that, there's there's nothing that he, you know, certainly never going to bring in a Thopter Spy Network in this matchup. And Disdainful Stroke is, is you know, it can it can get a stoke the flames, but it can't <laughs> yeah. get an exquisite firecraft most of the time. Right. Oh, or, 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 or ever. Or, or, or ever. ever. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, I would expect the Seismic Rupture to come in and maybe a, a couple of the Roasts, but not, not, Roast isn't even that impressive. It's it's okay, but you don't really want to spend a turn and right. two mana to, to deal with something that costs one to two mana to play. Right, and if the creature doesn't have flying, it's likely indestructible. <laughs> It sounds like the matchup doesn't change a, a huge amount in terms of once they've sideboarded. What about Luis in terms of going first versus going second? Because certainly now watching today the Insole Artifact deck in action, there is a very clear uh, I have serve sense of I'm on the play, here's my Ornithopter 1, here's my Insole Artifact 2, what are you doing? Um, and similarly, on the red side of the table, there is a very noticeably scripted opening there. As we see, uh, Sigrist's opening hand, which is going to go back uh, to the mix. So we certainly saw a Whirler Rogue in there, and uh, he decided he didn't have uh, what he needed. So he will go to 6, um, and at some point we'll get to Scry as we have a look at Yoel Larson's uh, opening, which right now he's looking at 7. He's going to be on the draw. It's just one mountain. It seems like a, a keepable hand. That the, the deck frequently keeps one land hands mm -hmm. just because, especially on the draw, if you basically the red deck wants to draw exactly two to three lands in a lot <laughs> of the games. Abbot of Curl Keep does mean that you can hit four or five and still be okay, but it does not want to draw six lands. You know, by turn six, so keeping a one lander means that you can cast a bunch of spells on one, and if you draw two, you can basically cast everything. Would you say you're much more likely to mulligan a, you know, like two or three spell hand than a one land hand? I, I think so. As, as two spell hand, like two spells, five lands is almost a, assuredly a mulligan. It, it takes two pretty special spells, like maybe one drop Eidolon on the play or something like that. <laughs> but for the most part, that is not a good hand. So there you see Larson trying to become a Pro Tour champion for the first time in his second final. Sigrist in his first final, as he will look at these six. There's a hangerback walker, one of the real stars of the weekend. Dark Steel Citadel, there's a lot of land there. It's a Phyrexian Revoker, four land and a hangerback walker by the looks of things. Sigrist is going to keep, and uh, therefore that island we expect will go to the bottom. And that's what it did. And Larson says, here we go. So we're away in game number two of our final. Larson leads one to zero in this best three out of five. And we didn't stay at 20 life points each for long. You know, look, looking at uh, Joel's hand, it looks like he did bring in the Eidolon of the Great Revol Revels here. Here's Hangerback Walker uh, on schedule uh, for Sigrist. Larson's turn to play. begins with an attack. 
Integra certainly can't block here because of the Swiss Spears 1-2. The question now for Yoles, he didn't hit a second land. Do you want to wild slash the hanger back walker and give Sigurd's token? It looks like looks like he's declining to do that. He just passes the turn with all sorts of ammunition, not yet the means to deploy it. Sigurds, we know, doesn't have difficulty with land. Indeed, his difficulty may be that he has far too much of it as the game progresses, but we'll see. Uh, Yol is going to reach out with his Wild Slash to kill off the Hangabout Walker, so Thopter comes along instead. Larson has not drawn a land again. And he does not have more burn spells. He's got a, a Zergo, but that, that, that's not something that can get rid of Chief of the Foundry. That's part of the reason that Sigurds want to drop Chief is that it was out of range of any one damage spell or one mana spell. So Sigrist working with a second Hangerback Walker and a Phyrexian Revoker. <laughs> and a second Chief. And of now his Chief. And now, in much the same way that Sigrist was desperately under the cosh in game one, this is Sigrist uh, repaying uh, the compliment here in game two. Yeah, just bashing for six here. Land for Yell? Yes. Okay, so that might start us towards more of a fair game. Uh, as he sends in uh, Zergo, who ironically is so much better now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now he started ringing bells instead of smashing homes. Yep, the campanologists for the win. The problem with uh, this this situation for Yol is that a two mana spell still can't kill a three four chief of the foundry, much less two of them. Cry from Mike Sigris leaves the card on top. And I, I like how aggressive Sigris is being here. When your opponent's stuck on lands and has you know six spells in their hand, you have to attack them. If they just start drawing lands, then you're just in, in a huge amount of trouble. Good. Yep, let's get him dead. Plays for Action Revoker, naming Lightning Berserker there. Yeah, we saw that with uh, Matt Sperling. You know, he had to. He had just enough time to draw out of it, had a handful of spells in that one game, and was able to uh, claw away. Here comes a Stoke the Flames. That's going to take down one Chief. Abbott back to block Revoker. There are a lot of cards that are basically just straight up lethal here. Shrapnel Blast and Soul Artifact. Whirler Rogue is pretty close, another Chief of the Foundry. And, but Sigurds thought for a while before keeping, which you know, doesn't necessarily mean he, it was a hard decision, but it means that he at the very least took his time. So it, I doubt it's one of those cards necessarily. Interestingly, uh, Sigurds named Lightning Berserker. Three of those came out in Joel Larson sideboarding along with three Fire Drinker Satyrs to make room for the two Arc Lightnings and the four Eidolons. So Sigrist is somewhat slowing down, uh, down to the Chief of the Foundry and a Thopter. Larson has three land and is starting to do things that his deck is meant to. Uh, but However, so Sigrist does a little scry action. Larson still with that Eidolon that he'd brought in, another Abbot, Searing Blood, and a Stoke the Flames. But he is down on four. You have how many cards? Bunch, four. And I think the card that Sigurds kept was Seismic Rupture. Oh, okay. It looked like it, it looked like it may have gotten entered as Shrapnel Blast mistakenly, but yes, it is Seismic Rupture. Go. So away goes Zergo. So at this point, Sigurds is hell bent, no cards in hand. So you all knows that, you know. He he's got he's got a little bit of time here. He tries he's hoping to hit a land off that uh that Abbott there. Two. Ghost but Fireblade would have done it there. Ghost Fireblade is the was, was the the big out. Ooh, hangerback walker. It has oh, to be. Oh, oh. A three three hangerback walker. Oh boy. That's not good news, Yol. No, it it's basically gonna be the abyss here. Yol's gonna have to chump block it every single turn, lose a lose a creature every turn to it. And if it ever dies. Three one one tokens is almost surely enough to close out the game. He holds it too. Right. Go. 
Yeah, this is the time that uh, dragon fodders and hordling outbursts might have been useful as little one yeah, ones followed to Followed up with a... <laughs> and there's his <laughs> soul okay. artifact, indestructible on the Dark Steel Citadel. What do you think, yo? Shall we go to best of three? <laughs> well, he's he's making it happen. I'll give him that, because only the Thopter uh, got yeah. through. <laughs> then, just to give the Thopter some extra camera yeah. time. Uh, so 1-1 one, one it is. The players are all tied up. We will be at best out of three now, because in total, our finals here at the Pro Tour are three out of five. So there we are. The finals all tied at one apiece. So, where do we go from here now? Well, uh, it will be back with uh, Larson uh, to uh, go first. There was some interesting uh, little byplay during the weekend. So often you, you see people like going on the play it. as the automatic default option for every deck ever. Um, we saw quite a lot of uh, back and forth, even this morning in the top eight, over choosing to draw with the red aggro deck uh, in certain matchups. So what, what's your sense, Luis, of where we might be in standard? Are, are there going to be decks that want to draw um, sometimes? Or do you still feel pretty much we're in a world of, I won the die roll, I shall play? The vast majority of the time you're going to play first. The only two matchups where I really see it draw, being on the draw is the super slow control versus control matchup where you just want to hit your land drops and super fast mono red versus mono red <laughs> matchup that where you all are playing one toughness creatures and shocks. So <laughs> And where you only want to hit two land drops. Right, and, exactly. And that's where it was. I was right, because wasn't it Stephen Neal this morning against Yo Larson in the quarterfinals right. that there was that dance of, uh, okay, I'm the highest seed, so I'll draw, thank you. And right. then I lost and I'll draw again. And... Um, right. so, and, yeah. and Joel at that point had said he had wanted to play, but actually chose to uh, actually chose to draw in the third game rather than give Stephen what he wanted. Right. And uh, talking to, to Pat Cox, had he won his match and played the Mono Red Mirror, he was also going to choose to draw. Ah, there we are. Okay, so that is certainly something worth noting. You take a look at uh, Yo Larson there. One of the reasons. Uh, that this red aggro deck is so powerful are some of the new toys available from Magic Origins and none finer, arguably, than this little flaming beauty, the exquisite Firecraft. Just everything about this is, it, it's a pretty straightforward Louis spell to see that this is constructed worthy. It's funny because three mana for four damage is a... Uh basically always made it into Constructed, and that's what these decks are playing it for. But the spell mastery is also very relevant. Part of the reason that we may not see very many control decks at the top tables is you're at four life, have three counter spells in your hand, they just draw one of these and you're dead. Yeah, talk, talking to the Team Ultra Pro guys who are all playing that mono red deck, you know, they, they were like, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily love this card in, in every matchup, but boy, you know, if you're playing against a control deck, you know, you kind of can't lose. You know, you just you soften them up with your with your early game, and then you just wait to draw your exquisite firecrafts and finish them off. Yeah, you get their life total towards measured in firecraft <laughs> increments. Oh, it's just two firecrafts away from dying. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, it's uh, it, you know, and it's fine without it's fine without spell spell mastery. Oh, and, you for know, sure. You're just like just clear your stupid coarser crucifix out of the way. We are going to clear Exquisite Firecraft out of the way because our players are ready to give us the third act Jeez. of this final game of the Pro Tour season. Larson against Sigrist. Best two out of three remaining. Larson on the play. Let's see what happens. Do we have a turn one play we from Larson? Do. Bang. Monastery Swiss Spear. In we go. Clock, tick, tick, tick. Sigrist, do we have a turn one play? We do. Ornithopter and Ghost Fireblade. Tick, tick, tick. There you get a look at uh, Mike Sigrist's hand, a pair of shrapnel blasts and a hanger back walker. And this is Joel Larson's hand with the Eidolon of the Great Revel. Coming down now. And it's burn, 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 and he has exactly that third mountain that he might want at some point. Uh, that is pretty much it. Larson will happily take spells the rest of the way. And by the rest of the way, we may not mean very long. Sigrist now, now has the decision whether he wants to equip the Ghostfire Blade, which is very tempting because a 2-4 Ornithopter only dies to Stoke and Firecraft. 
But if he's doing that, he's kind of giving up playing an effective spell, particularly a hanger back walker. Uh, Eidolon is looking pretty good here on the play, I will have to admit, because hanger back walker, spring leaf drum, does, does in fact punish him. Though, let's, let's see if he ends up, how much he ends up taking from Eidolon there. Uh, looks like the answer was zero off that hanger back walker, <laughs> just, just so we're clear. Sigus with double shrapnel blast. So Larson's 20. And an soul <laughs> artifact now. Ooh. We, oh, wow. we could just have a, have a race here. Couple of lightning strikes in hand for Joel Larson. So if Sigrist goes in soul on my Ghost Fire Blade, takes two, I'm assuming, from the Eidolon, uh, goes to 13, he can then attack for five down to 15 and leave up Hangerback Walker with two mana. And it's important to do it on the Ghost Fire Blade so that the artifact itself can't get Lightning Strike out from under the enchantment. Right. Oh, sorry. I can't respond to that. <laughs> <laughs> and there we go. There is not. But you're attacking, so... 15, says Larson. Okay. And I don't want it's a little awkward here because Yoel really wants to fire off one of these lightning strikes. He has so much mana in his hand, or so much, so many cards in his hand that cost mana, but he's going to start getting hit by his Eidolon, and he's getting into Shrapnel Blast could range. Be, could be dead next turn. Uh, take three. I'll take two. So he's trying to race because he's just aiming it at Sigrist. But Hangerback Walker is so good here because let's say let's say Yola attacks with both. Sigrist can go block Eidolon with Hangerback Walker, block Swift Spear with Ornithopter if he wants even, make Hangerback Walker a 2 2, trade for Eidolon and get two tokens, end up with a bunch of tokens and two tokens and a 5 5 in play. Still at 10 life. Here comes the attack from Joel. The other thing I like about blocking Swift Spear with Ornithopter is it forces you all to, to use a burn spell. Otherwise, the Ornithopter lives through the fight. Okay. That's incredible. So now you try to put a counter on Hanger back. You all might respond to that. Yep. So if you respond to that in Lightning Strikes, you all goes down to 11. Yeah. But then gets attacked for 6 down to 5 and gets shrapnel blasted to death. <laughs> he, he doesn't know that. Mm -hmm. I mean, he doesn't know there's a shrapnel blast. But if he does not do, if he does not cast Lightning Strike here, then Eidolon and Hangerback Walker trade, and he's facing down 7 power with attackers. Yeah, so Sigurds is going to win this game. Because <laughs> shrapnel blast does what it's always done, put players in the bin. All that target creature nonsense. Get the player dead. <laughs> Am I dead? Well, um, yeah. Yeah, no loss. Yeah. Go yes. to five. Yes, <laughs> yo, you're dead. The three scariest words Mike Sigris can say to you. You're at five? Yeah. <laughs> Mike Sigris leads by two games to one, and this extraordinary weekend continues for him. He came in... 13 points adrift of the lead in the Player of the Year race, 47 to Frolic 60, with a slew of Hall of Famers and giants of the game between the two. He kept on winning. He edged his way into the top eight at 12 and 4. He won his quarterfinal. He won his semi final and became Player of the Year and the captain of the World Magic Cup team for Team USA. And right now, he is one. Game away from the whole shebang and ending the season with the Pro Tour Championship of Magic Origins. But Yo Larson has all the burn in the world and he wants to force a game five. Well, why don't we take a look while we wait to see whether red can prevail at a card that doesn't have a color but probably doesn't care all that much, Hanger Back Walker. Yeah, I mean, we just saw how good that card was just in terms of, you know, you, you, people have talked about it, you know, just put it, putting it out there for one blocking 
getting a token back, like being able to, against these aggressive red decks, being able to just kind of like, you know, force field them for two turns. A two mana one on that dies into a one on flyer is already kind of annoying to deal with. The <laughs> removal spell does not interact well there. And the fact that it dub kind of doubles every turn in terms of value, like, well, it goes from a one one that makes one one to a two two that makes two two twos to a three three that makes three three threes. Like, that, that's a lot more than just getting one bigger every turn. And later in the game, you can cast it for six mana and have it be a three three right off the bat. Hangerback is going to see play in a lot of decks going forward, not just this artifact deck. It already is. BDM Magic Origins uh, is a set that has plenty of tribal things going on. There are certainly goblins uh, around, although Pile Driver did very little this weekend. There are plenty of elves around, although Dwynan and her elite didn't necessarily uh, go very far. But if it is a tribal Pro Tour, it is the Thopters. Oh, I, I, absolutely. We saw two of the blue-red Thopter decks here in the top eight. They were littered throughout uh, the field. They, you know, multiple high-end teams uh, ended up deciding that that was the strategy they wanted to bring to the Pro Tour. We saw, you know, Pia and Kieran Noir. We saw Hangerback Walker. We saw Thopter Engineers. I don't know if I don't know if anyone deigned to play a Gear Report Gear Crafter I think, or not. I think we had that in one of the dead <laughs> decks. I'm pretty, I, I, on, I'm pretty sure we did. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's uh, certainly, <laughs> certainly a Thopter, a Thopter fest uh, here, uh, and, and Thopter Spy Network, is, which is here in the finals. I mean, we're we're not gonna see it, <laughs> but it it's here. So, uh, what beats a Nort Nort? Well, pretty much anything. How about a Lightning Berserker? That's bigger than a Nort Nort, technically. Mm. There you see Lightning Berserker, something that Yol Larson is hoping to get the job done. <laughs> The Human Berserker with Dash. A lot of the time it comes down for that one red. And uh, then that's his Mana Sink. Mountain, mountain, mountain. Suddenly it's a 4-1. Uh, and uh, certainly he's done a lot of great work for the red decks uh, as we've seen. Yeah, Luis, you were talking about the idea of like drawing too much land in the red deck. This is a card that can mitigate that, right? Yeah, between this and Abbott, the red deck can win games on five or six mana, which is not always historically been true. And we saw like that game against Matt Sperling where Yol's just like, Lightning Berserker hit you for five, and Sperling's <laughs> like, all right. <laughs> and once that happens, like even one time, it feels like the red deck has just won the game. Yeah, you, you heard Ian call it the, the fireball with buyback a couple times, just sort of, you know, not because he was reading it off a slide like we are. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's that's actually what, you know, he, he that's his sort of mental shorthand for the card. I was going to say fireball on wheels, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> this works too. Yo Larson could certainly do with a Lightning Berserker out of the gates and ideally no Ornithopters, no Hangabout Walkers getting in the way and certainly no turn two in Soul Artifacts making things almost out of range. And that's how far an Ornithopter and an in Soul Artifact Mike Sigrist might be away from being the Pro Tour champion. Uh, we will see how things go. The players are still working through their options. So Sigrist Looking right now at those six cards, you see a Chief of the Foundry at Shiv and Reef and Mountain on the far side. And he's looking, oh, is he going to five? Looks like he is. It's going to be five cards for the player of the so year. So there's good news and bad news when you're playing this deck. The, the bad news is that you mulligan to five and mulligan to six a lot more than you do with most other decks. Why? Uh, the good news is because <laughs> those hands having soul artifact in them is what you're looking for. And you often have to mulligan a hand of like three lands, four spells, because those four spells are just not ones that work together. A hand of too many springleaf drums and not enough creatures, or too many whirler rogues, whereas normal decks don't do that. Or two ghost fire blades. Right, right exactly. Mm. And the good news is you don't need five cards to win or seven cards to win. You need a Dark Steel Citadel Island, an Ornithopter, and a Soul Artifact. Those four cards already give you a really good chance of winning. So is there a sense uh, of, therefore, rather than being forced to mulligan, it's more an aggressive mulligan that says, I would like to head towards almost combo pieces in that sense, because that's traditionally what uh, where you see that a lot. So uh, we'll see what uh, Sigris comes up with. Uh, got a glimpse of an Ornithopter, a Ghost Fire Blade, Chief of the Foundry, Shrapnel Blast. And he's scrying. It's gone to the bottom. So here we go with game number four. Larson away with Zergo Bellstriker. Must win to keep the Pro Tour alive. Ornithopter, Ghostfire Blade, Ornithopter. <laughs> he mulliganed to five and, and four cards in play on turn one. <laughs> 
He lost an attack. Did he, did he side in his uh, day's undoing? Y Yol is not playing a land on turn two. No, Yol's hand, I mean, you can see Lightning Berserker, Abbot of Carol Keep, a couple of Eidolons, uh, Wild Slash, and a Lightning Strike. And uh, Sigrus went through the motions there of uh, attempting to get Ghostfire Blade equipped, uh, but Wild Slash was ready uh, for Larson, so he will get to attack again. Uh, with his Zerga Bell Strike. And now here is Lightning oh, Berserker. Oh, is that a Th soul that is. artifact in hand? So you just slam it on the Ghost Fire Blade, go to town. Is that the moment that Sigrist claims the Pro Tour title? Second land, Second. now for Joel. Yep. He's attacking back, but in a pretty casual fashion. I'm not sure I uh, overly fond of the body language there. <laughs> The good thing, the good thing for Yol is that he does have a steady stream of cards to throw in the way. The the bad thing for him is that Sigrus still gets to to do things. He he's gonna get to play a chief of the foundry next turn after after scrying with Temple this turn. Yep. And Sigrus can, if you would like, cast Trapnel Blast here. Is Larson going to come up short in the finals for a second time on Canadian soil? It's a phenomenal achievement just to be here. But he is in trouble with the scissors. Uh, this is a very, very close game here. I, I, I don't think that it, it, it's, any, it's in any way over just because you all uh, can throw a chump blocker on the way every turn. Like, the way this race is going, it does favor for favor Yol because he gets to chump every turn right. and attack for four every turn. Sigrus is going to get to start playing things here, though. Is there is there any turn where Mike Sigrus pumps the brakes a little bit and just keeps his Goose Fire Blade back? He, he can. It, that is definitely an option. It, it's not. If it's going to get chumped, it's you might, you might as well attack. Okay. That is that is slightly better, but yeah, he has to decide now whether he looks like he's going to cast Shrapnel Blast here. Who oh. at you? So this isn't looking too bad because now you can attack. Here's Chief of the Foundry. And the trigger from Eidolon of the Great Rebel puts Sigris to yeah. eight. I, I think I favor just attacking there. Yul's going to chump. He's not, he's not going to take five. Right. And so then post-combat playing Chief, and you, you end up at two life higher because you're not attacking with the Ornithopter anyway. Larson, three mana, fourth in hand, which he now plays. And I keep from here. Lightning Strike takes down the Chief of the Foundry. Gets in for five. Yeah. Oh, so tight! I like chumping the Abbot here. If one of the advantages of chumping with the Abbot is it's three power creature because of prowess. You, you save yourself from dying to a one single burn spell. Larson adds Idol onto the Great Revel again. Sigris draws. He attacks. Larson blocks. Passes back. Is Larson going to force game five? Ten to six. Ten to six. We're in agreement. Those are the scores. Exquisite so firecraft, you. <laughs> we and are on to we, game five. Yes, there we go. Larson fought back. The scissors were not game over. We had a stream of things to uh, get in the way of sharp, pointy objects. And we have a game five. Fantastic. And I mean, Ornithopter, not, not, not the most impressive piece on its own, but you see why it's in that deck, right? I mean, that ability for the Ornithopter to pick up the uh, enchantment and fly over. Yeah, Ornithopters work incredibly well within Soul. They also enable Springleaf Drum and Ghostfire Blade to be cards. So you, you really <laughs> need or Ornithopter to make this deck work. So we've certainly seen uh, Yo use Eidolon of the Great Revel a fair amount uh, through this top eight. Here it is uh, once again from Journey into Nyx. Uh, of course, pretty much all constructed formats have found uh, a use for the red, red spell. Pyrostatic Pillar, Scourge, that was in the early 2000s, a similar card that uh, people used to bring in against uh, combo decks. 
And, well, here we are. We're looking at creatures and enchantments, and here it is as an enchantment creature. You get the Nyx Starfield uh, in the background. Forgot the fourth bullet point, which is chump blocking ghost fire blades. Yeah, that, that was well, really what it was designed to do. <laughs> I'm very surprised that we didn't, uh, we couldn't quite fit it on just at the yeah, bottom there. Yeah, just the top three. Mm. Uh, yeah, this is, I mean, it was a card we weren't sure if y'all would bring this card in and for this matchup. Well, <laughs> it does not look good so far, but <laughs> I, I do believe that you do want it on the play. Uh, the, part of the problem I have is that. Sigurd is just going to dump his Ornithopters and Springleaf Drums into play on turn one, so it's not going to hit that many cards. But it does p pack more of a punch than Fire Drinker Seder or Lightning Berserker, which uh, is what he took uh, out. Right, exactly. I feel like I feel like Fire Drinker Seder is is not an excellent chump blocker <laughs> for the five power. No, I played against Frank Carson in this exact matchup, <laughs> round one of Constructed of the Pro Tour, and I got to roast a Fire Drinker Seder. Which, oh my gosh! If you're the controller of it, uh, <laughs> that, that's not not good times. Uh, uh, you know, we we haven't actually talked about how Mike Sigrist has has sideboard. We knew he uh, brought in the seismic ruptures, but he also brought in one roast. Uh, took out two Stubborn Denials and took out two Phyrexian Revokers. Yeah, it's funny. He actually drew a Stubborn Denial that last game. Oh, so he but, may have... But was going to die to all the creatures in play anyway. Stubborn Denial does have some utility here. you just having the Miser Stubborn Denial. When you have Insole out, it can save you from a Lethal Burn spell. So Larson has Eidolon of the Great Revel. Uh, what about Springleaf Drum on the other side of the table? Let's see what that's doing uh, for Mike Sigrist. Uh, the modern affinity deck uh, gives it some explosive starts. Yes, it's in Born of the Gods, uh, but we've seen it before. In standard, a game-ending combo. Uh, you get Retraction, Helix, Jeskai, Ascendancy. Uh, but this goes right the way back to 2007, another tribal set uh, in Lorwyn. Yeah, Li Shi Tian, big part of his year, has involved playing Springleaf Drum, playing playing that Jeskai Ascendancy combo deck. You, you guys played a version of this as well, right? We did. We we didn't have Springleaf Drums in our deck. We just had Sylvan Carry Tid as the mana creature, but Springleaf Drum is definitely a part of how some of those decks are built. It's also a big part of why this artifact deck works. It's a one-mana artifact that you can ensoul, that gives you fuel for Shrapnel Blast, and it makes it so your Ornithopters and Revokers tap for mana. So... One of these two will emerge from this last duel of the 2014-2015 Pro Tour season. This seems a great opportunity to thank each and every one of you for being part of our coverage team over the past 12 months. We'll do it all again because we had so much fun this time around. Four mountains, three spells for Larson. There's Sigrist looking and sending away. And that looked from the glimpse I got like another one of those hands where you've got a couple lands, you got a couple spells, but you just can't keep a hand of like Whirler Rogue, Shrapnel Blast, two Ornithopters, three lands. It just the hand does not do anything. It, it almost feels like he's just mulliganed any hand that's opened with a Whirler Rogue. <laughs> that is actually probably the worst card in the deck to see in your opening hand. It's just you want to draw that card, yeah, turn three or four. You don't really want it taking up opening hand slots. The old hand is not spectacular. Fiery Impulse, Lightning Strike, Eidolon, and four lands, but definitely a keepable hand, especially on the draw. Wow. That, 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 to me, that to me feels pretty gutsy with your, your Pro Tour on the line, though, to keep a, a four-land hand mono right, red. Be, be, because you're very close to Flood right there. I mean, he basically doesn't want another land ever. Yeah, if he draws no other lands, I think he's probably a huge favorite <laughs> to win the game. But What, what if they're all Eidolon? <laughs> well, the Eidolons don't tend to get better in multiples, but... Still, you, you've got to keep that. You can shock the turn one play, you can strike the turn two play, and you have an Eidolon as a threat. I, you don't, I don't think that you can mulligan that hand, finals or not. <laughs> ah, well, good that is nice. Between well them. done. Well done, guys. So much on the line here. 40,000 US dollars to the winner, 20,000 to the runner-up. They will see each other at the World Magic Cup. They will both be team captains at the end of the year for Sweden and Team USA, respectively. And Sigrist now is looking at plenty of land, a Shrapnel Blast, Phyrexian Revoker. That doesn't look super exciting either, Luis. It doesn't, but especially with the scry you get after a mulligan, I could see keeping that. Siggy just is not having it, but... I I think that's a that's a respectable keep. You get to scry on turn one. If you like it, you don't have to play your temple turn one. Like if you see an insole, you have two more shots at insole essentially. But a hand is worse than almost any hand that has insole. So at five, uh, at this point, is he almost all in on trying to find quote unquote the perfect hand because anything less than the perfect hand won't be sufficient to overcome the mulligans he's doing here? That's more true than when he started. It's not the, the whole story because 
Yeah, if Yule's first two draw steps are land and Sigrist gets his first two things killed, they're both kind of in equal territory. The, the additional lands don't help Yule at all. Sigrist could also open up with a hand of like a couple lands, a drum, a creature, and a Whirler Rogue. The creature gets shocked, Sigrist draws another, and then plays a Whirler Rogue. And Whirler Rogue is very good if you can resolve it. It, it trades for multiple burn spells. <laughs> all right, here it is, five cards. <laughs> What do we have, Mike Sigrist? Shrapnel Blast. Land. Drum. Two Shrapnel Blasts, Whirlerug, and a land. Oh, boy. Yep. I, yeah, I don't like that hand. I like the other hand a lot better. And, and, he, and he clearly views that hand with the Whirlerug in it as a mulligan to four already. Yeah, and, it's, and the Shrapnel Blast, too. Shrapnel Blast is sure. not a card you want in your opening hand. It's the, frequently the card you want to draw most on turn four and turn five and beyond. But in your opening hand, it's like you're not going to kill your opponent. You don't want to Shrapnel Blast oh, yeah. an early creature. How hard is it not to get overexcited BDM on the other side of the table? Because when you're up against someone that good, it's the player of the year, the captain of the, the, world, the World Magic Cup team for USA, the guy who's sitting st between you and a Pro Tour title. You're in your second final. And he's down to four. So all I know is when my opponent mulligans to four, I'm like, oh, please don't let me lose this game. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, yeah, it's also brutal because you right now is thinking like, all right, I got this, I got this. But Sigurds can open on a hand that, that wins him the game. Another shrapnel blast. They're know. everywhere. Seismic to rupture. Insult to in injury to insult. He's got the mana confluence there to start yeah. doing some the work The worst against possible him. land. Oh. But what what three can you have? In Soul Island and Darksteel Citadel. <laughs> oh. that, that three is and probably a is, favorite. <laughs> he is into the tank. He's had an incredible weekend, so the words poor Mike Sigris don't come naturally. But yeah. Jesus Christ. four to three. Uh, I like that mulligan, too. <laughs> I mean, I, as, as much as I hate the idea of mulliganing down to three, that you, you've, got, you've got better hands you can hit. Like, you're not going to win the game with that hand. There are hands that can definitely win you the game. That is steel, though, from Mike Sigris. Well done. I mean, just to... <laughs> Just to be able to put yourself in that seat and go, no, this is the correct play. I'm going to go to three, three cards. We've seen the Seif on camera win with four. I'm not sure, historian, whether we've ever seen <laughs> I don't, I don't. three on camera. I win. certainly haven't watched anyone on three. Please win. have three good cards. Ghost Fire Blade, Mountain, <laughs> and Shrapnel Blast. We're away There's in an the ornithopter final on game. top. Yeah, it's going to get Fiery Impulse, though. And Larson does indeed like, yeah. say goodbye. <laughs> and Yul drew, drew two spells in a row, so... There's the Eidolon. The Eidolon of the Great Revel. It's been an amazing run for Sigrist. He had the shot in game four, where we thought he was favored before Larson pulled that one out. Mm, Sigurds drew a blue source now. Mm -hmm. He's got, he, at least now he can draw in Soul Artifact. Larson draws, keeps drawing spells. And <laughs> Larson will happily take damage to put another Eidolon of the Great Revel into play. Yeah, I don't hate Maybe Shrap Shrapnel Blasting the other Eidolon here in response. That, that seems to be where Mike Sigrist is thinking about. What do you sacrifice? Nope, he's going to let it resolve. 16, he drew the insole. <laughs> he don't. Puts the insole artifact on the Dark Steel mm. Citadel. Five. Uh, yeah, five. He has to take five to do it. He needs to use a Shivan Reef <laughs> and two Eidolon triggers. Whoa. Two mana, lose five life. And now Sigrist is at four, and Yol Larson, who got to the final here in Canada in 2013 at Pro Tour Gate Crash. 16 plays four. Sigrist is kind of locked under Eidolon here. 
Joel Larson could be moments away from a Pro Tour title. Fiery impulse, searing blood, searing blood in hand. <laughs> Sigrist passes. Larson passes. Sigrist passes again. Larson keeps drawing decent stuff. He started with plenty of land, but he has not flooded out. No, I don't. I think he's drawn one land in the rest of spells so far. Though some of those spells have not been great. Like drawing Searing Bloods when there's nothing to kill is not exactly what you want. Yeah, that in soul just came a, a few turns too late. Had it been happened on turn two, maybe turn three even, it would have been enough. <laughs> Joel might be <laughs> his. Yeah, also, so similarly impinged by his own. Well, Joel in, just gets in, to attack in, for lethal here. In. Yep. There's the block. <laughs> and Tug hit me. There's the match. Yo, Larson is the champion of Pro Tour Magic Origins, and he is super stoked to that. And not just the Flames, he is thrilled to claim the title. There he goes. He runs his fingers through his hair. He has done the job, and what a player he took down to do it. Mike Sigrist is the captain of Team America for the World Magic Cup. He's the player of the year. He's had a phenomenal weekend, but that man is the champion of Proto Magic yeah. Origins, Joel Larsen of Sweden. Yeah, we, we'll get a chance to see both of these players maybe get a rematch against each other in just a few weeks at the World Championship. Both players will be competing in that elite field of 24 players. Uh, you know, Joel obviously gets there as the champion of the Pro Tour, and Mike Sigris gets there as the player of the year. Yeah, Luis, uh, we actually got, even though it was pretty short, it was a terrific final. We don't often see that kind of smashing into each other. No, terrific. no it was awesome to see. I mean, I, I wish the mulligan to three didn't happen, but <laughs> past that, I mean, th that matchup played out the way it usually does, which is like a lot of tight races. Th that said, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, you know, people say, oh, it's terrible that he mulligan. But the fact is he, he made correct decisions or, or made very active decisions about his cards and, and what he's doing. So, you know, made the correct decisions along the way, would you say? I would have mulliganed all his hands, except the, the only debatable one, I think, is the six-card hand. But even then, that's well within the range of, like, you can mulligan. Gentlemen, it's been an honor and a privilege to share this Pro Tour season with you both. Thank you for all your considerable expertise and knowledge. Uh, and to you, we have a Pro Tour champion. It's Yoel Larson. For all the reaction and post-game analysis, let's head you back to the news desk and Marshall Sutcliffe. Thank you, Rich. Welcome back to the news desk here at Pro Tour Magic Origins. Wow, gentlemen, that was a fiery finish to the Pro Tour there. We promised a slugfest before we went down there, Ian, and we certainly got one. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was <laughs> I was watching. <laughs> it was really tense as, as Sigrist was taking his mulligans there. I thought when he got down to four cards, you know, there was no way. We were debating, should he keep the four? Should he go down to three? I was like, I think he needs to go down to three and get, you know, something perfect there. And, you know, it turns out it wasn't enough for him, but it was remarkably close. I mean, that what, I think we were all, like, Catching our breath there yeah. when the, the, the Insol artifact came down the Dark Steel Citadel, like maybe there's a chance here. So I mean, it, it stayed exciting the entire time, and that set of five was just awesome all the way through. So really, really exciting. Yeah, Eric, the the match went to five games. Uh, pretty tough mulligans down the stretch there, but still an entertaining and uh, punch-filled five-game match there for our finalists. Yeah, I think that matchup's really close between the Insol artifact deck and the red deck. It's a matchup I played several times in the Swiss, and I managed to win every game, but I believe I didn't end any game at higher than two life. So wow. <laughs> there's a, a lot of good oh, action, a lot, a, yeah, a lot of really close games. Stubborn denials were, were huge in my matchup, which didn't actually play out there, but I got to keep seven card hands. <laughs> like That's the difference, and I think we saw like with how close that game was on three cards, if you had four extra cards or maybe even <laughs> two extra cards and that and so artifact comes out a little bit earlier, you know, is able to interact a little bit more. Mm -hmm. We have a real game on, on a mold of oh, five yeah. that Tigris might have just won. And yeah, it's just, you know, sometimes you go to three. Yeah. So congratulations, of course, to Yoel Larson, our champion here. You can hear everybody cheering for him in the background. Let's take a look at how he got there, though, and how the top eight played out from a bigger picture perspective here. We start things off. 
believe down at the bottom of our screen with our now champion, Joel Larson from Sweden. He moved on past Stephen Neal of the United States in our next match. We had oh, That might have been our Ruben. craziest match of them all, too. That, yeah. that was the burn back and forth where game one of our very first game of the entire top eight <laughs> involved you'll need to draw a one drop into draw a four damage spell when he was just dead. Yes. And he did exactly that in impressive fashion and carried it all the way to the end. Matt Sperling defeats Matt, uh, Pat Cox in the next match. Up above that, we have our Australian Paul Jackson. And uh, he got by Stefan Berrios from the Chicago area. Paul Jackson, congratulations to him, by the way. A great finish for his country, Australia. There. Yeah, He's locking be up the team captain captaincy, also, right? Yeah, yeah. of that. Um, and then, of course, on the top, we had Mike Sigris defeating Kentaro Yamamoto from Japan, coming in as the first seed with his Abzan Megamorph deck and a 5-1-1 record in the uh, limited portion. He had to knock off Kentaro, no small feat, but, uh, but Sigris does, in fact, advance. Then we jump back down to the bottom part of the bracket where we had Yul Larson against Matt Sperling playing Abzan Control. Probably the slowest deck we have here in the top eight versus the fastest, and uh, the fastest one this time, Yul Larson able to get by Matt. Yeah, I blinked there accidentally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, we had Mike Sigris defeating Paul Jackson in his Green Red Devotion deck to set up the finals of Blue Red and Soul Artifact versus Mono Red. Again, two very assertive, aggressive decks produce a champion. Yul Larson from Sweden, you can take a look Ed Yol there, congratulations to him. We are actually setting up to have a word with Yol. We'll have him here at the desk. And, uh, we'll ask him what it felt like watching his opponent <laughs> mulligan into oblivion on game five. It's this bittersweet thing. I know Yol's a, a competitor, a sportsman. It's never fun to see, you know, you, you, you want to have a good clean fight, but at the same time with the PT on the line, you, know, you can't feel that bad about watching your opponent just keep mulliganing, right? Well, I mean, bear in mind he was coming back from a, a two to one deficit in the best of five. So, like, there was a moment where he was on the brink of disaster as well. And it's just such a roller coaster ride through that finals that you can never breathe a sigh of relief, right? Even if your opponent's mulliganing down and down, like, you're happy, but you're not through it yet. And as we saw, that last game was remarkably close despite the mulligans. So. Yeah, it, it did end up getting to be a little bit close there. Uh, the two Eidolon of the Great Revel, Eric, you know, uh, Luis was in the booth saying, you know, he wasn't quite sure how good they were. If you're on the play, he says, yeah, sure, you'll have them. Um, they did a critical role there having two of them. And since so many of the, the spells from the red-blue deck are so cheap, it kind of just locked them out. Yeah, it certainly is capable of locking an opponent out. The problem was, and why Luis was a little bit skeptical, is the soul deck is really fast too. Yes. It has five point burn spells for two for two mana. And so while the red deck, of course, has its four point burn spells for three mana, like this artifact deck can just go five, five, five. Like that in soul artifact can come down before Eidolon even hits. And now you're locking yourself out of the game. Shrapnel Blast can finish you off from a pretty high life total, especially if you're dealing two to yourself to cast your own spells, because the old decks can't get around the Eidolon itself. So, yeah, it's, it's an interesting card that when you're at parity or a little bit ahead, it's great. It gives you a little extra time to draw those burn spells. doesn't let your opponent play the cheap spells to try to interact with you. But if they're already ahead, which they easily can be, you know, Mike was on the play in that last game. He could have got off to a seven-card blistering start, and Eidolon could have just locked you all out of the game. So, yeah, it, when your opponent's down a couple cards and you get an advantage, Eidolon's fantastic. In that game, it was very good. In that game, it was very good. Okay, we're ready to head down to the feature match area where Richard Hagen is there for the trophy ceremony. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the award ceremony here at Pro Tour Magic Origins in Vancouver, Canada. We begin this end of season roundup with your rookie of the year. Please welcome to the stage from the United States of America, Justin Cohen. <laughs> Justin, congratulations. Obviously a fantastic rookie season for you. What's the goal for next year? Platinum. One word, and a great word it is too. Ladies and gentlemen, your Rookie of the Year, Justin Cohen. <laughs> Next, it's congratulations to our finalist here, but not just the finalist, also the American World Magic Cup captain, and also your Player of the Year for 2040-2015 from the United States, Mike Sigrist. Mike. 
Mike, congratulations. It looks like you don't have enough hands for all the trophies. Um, I know that you have twins on the way. What does it mean to you um, as a father-to-be to be on top of the magic world? Uh, it's great. They can come into the world, see this stuff. I don't know. <laughs> I've lost for words right now. Well, you do it where it matters at the table. Ladies and gentlemen, your player of the year, Mike Sigrist. <laughs> And now, your champion of Pro Tour Magic Origins, from Sweden, Jarl Larsson. <laughs> Jarl, in 2013, you came to Canada. You made it all the way to the final of Pro Tour Gate Crash and didn't quite make it all the way. How much more fun is getting the trophy? I mean, you can't describe it. It's insane. Like, uh, almost thought it was going to be a deja vu when I won the first game convincingly and starting to losing the second and the third game. And I'm like, not again. <laughs> but I finally got there in the end, and it feels, I'm ecstatic. And you've got a great community behind you from Scandinavia. Uh, well, not just Scandinavia. This is well, half of Europe. <laughs> but... Yeah, Team Toma was great again. Uh, Reddick wins again. Same team, same deck. Pretty good. Well, maybe the rest of the Pro Tour will learn. Red's the way, and uh, congratulations to the Pro Tour champion here of Magic Origins, Yo Larson. <laughs> And that, of course, concludes our Pro Tour season. Thanks to all of you for being a part of it. Let's do it all again. And that concludes the award ceremony from here in Vancouver. Hello there, welcome back to the news desk. So congratulations to our Rookie of the Year, our Player of the Year, and of course our champion here, Yoel Larson. We are going to have an interview with him in just a few moments, get a, get a chance to chat with somebody who just won a PT. It's always great, you'll have, oh, yeah. you'll have a big check and a trophy and be on top of the world, so that's fantastic. What moments stand out for you guys over the course of the weekend? Eric, what were some of the highlights for you? Um, <laughs> there was a lot of highlights. Uh, for me, my personal tournament, uh, it's was a hell of a comeback. I, I, I haven't had many I've things I've never like seen that. a comeback like that since I've been covering it. But, uh, yeah, it's, I got inducted to the Hall of Fame this weekend. or I got That was announced and uh, got to play a lot of magic. got to spend time with my friends. I got to be in the booth for the first time. A, a lot of great moments for me. I actually really enjoy the set. I, I don't say that very often. I'm usually a little <laughs> bit more critical. I'm definitely one of those who are more vocal. But I've really enjoyed playing the set in Limited. I was pretty critical of this set for Constructed. And as I started playing with it more and more, I, I found new synergies, new exciting things. And I don't feel like there's any deck that's incredibly overpowered. I feel like every deck it can be, you know, metagamed against and had a lot of fun playing them. So. Yeah. yeah, it's a good tournament. Good what about for you, Ian? What stands out for you? It was an exciting weekend all around. Um, I particularly enjoyed watching the constructed portion of the Swiss. We saw a diversity of decks, some old, some new. We saw, you know, Nick Starfield. We saw the Soul Artifact deck, of course, Demonic <laughs> Pact, one of my favorites there to watch. There are some good ones out yeah, there. Yeah, so that was pretty cool. You know, check them out if, if you missed anything along the way. The top eight was awesome as well. I actually loved the first game of the top eight, I think it was, so yeah. the, the red deck mirror, um, as Eric was talking about before. The final sequence of that game where Larson just had to go for it with, you know, four point burn to the face, needed, needed to draw a one drop that turn, and then another four point burn spell the following turn. It was one of those like, you know, Craig jo Jones moments, if, if the viewers at home are familiar yeah. with that, where you just have to go for it, knock the top, and hope you hit it, and he did. And, you know, that was instrumental in how the rest of the top eight played out. Yeah, he, that won him game one. He ended up winning the match, and now he's won the entire Pro Tour off the back of that. And those are the type of plays that you need, right? <laughs> I mean, to win a Pro Tour, I think anybody that's done it or had a good deep run at this level will tell you that you're going to have to get lucky a time or two. You, you are, for sure. I mean, it, you know, obviously you have to be super skillful, but there are also th you know, things you need to swing your way at key moments, and that was a great example of that. Yeah, and that was a super fun one to watch, too. Yeah, I loved watching all the limited play out. You know, I'm a, a draft junkie of sorts, and... Uh, so it was fun for me to get a chance to see how the pros 
related all of the things that we've been talking about and thinking about and practicing for uh, Grand Prix Dallas Fort Worth the weekend before and put them into play here at the Pro Tour. A lot of different ideas, a lot of different things. And, you know, for constructed, I have to say, <laughs> if you would have told me that it would have been like ornithopter, mnemonic pack, like, yeah. <laughs> would not have believed you. <laughs> you know, after seeing quite a long time where we've seen, you know, red green decks and uh, sea drino type decks, you know, these mm -hmm. sort of mid range powerful decks that, that you can you can tweak one way or the other to go a little longer, a little earlier in the game. I kind of got used to that. And all of a sudden now people are attacking for five on turn two in their blue red deck. Yeah, and what was especially cool for me is that if you look at the Insole Artifact deck, a lot of those, those cards were there all <coughs> along. You know, Shrapnel Blast, Dark Steel Citadel, Insole Artifact, those are all M15 cards, right? They've been sitting there latent for a year. Just waiting. And they just, it turns out they just needed a little nudge from Magic Origins, or maybe just, you know, the, the right, you know, sort of circumstances to, to come forward. And for all the brewers out there, there's a lot of awesome stuff like that. That's why magic is so awesome. That's why we love it. There's all those cool things lurking under the surface. So go out there and find them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah all right. So we're we'll synergies. Corset yeah. synergies. There they are. All right. Let's bring in Yoel Larson, our champion here. Come on over here, Yoel. You can come to the end. Yep. Bring your big check and your trophy. Yep. And there we go. Congratulations, Yo Larson. Thanks, you are man. our champion. Congratulations. Thank We're you. We're all very Thank happy you. for you. We made it exciting, too. <laughs> Talk us through those last few turns. Uh, you know, Sigrist Mulligan all the way down to three. Yeah. How does it feel from your seat watching your opponent <laughs> Mulligan Mulligan? I know you're a sportsman, but there's that thing on the line, too. Yeah, I know. I, it felt obviously great, but I tried to temper the feelings of me getting overconfident, which is... Uh, classic downfall for a magic player that's so far ahead so i tried to keep my calm as long as i could and try to do my decisions collectively because i've lost so many times for that so now and i did and i felt great <laughs> so, so was there a point when you thought okay i think i've got this thing locked up uh in the game i mean it ended up being a bit more of a game than we thought it would be yeah. considering the mulligans yeah i when i had the buff islands here it's at four i Drew my second Monastery Swift Spear, and uh, I was thinking like, okay, what is this deck? Is, does it have any instant for four? Like, no, that's unreasonable, but let's think again. And, and I cut, come, came to the conclusion that he had nothing, so I could just play out my things, and, and I don't forced him to not play anything. So and so, finish yeah. him off from there, and that you did. Now, what a huge tournament for you also. You've locked up a lot of accomplishments here. Not only yeah. Pro Tour <laughs> Champion, you've got your Platinum locked up, you've got your World Championship you, seat, you are the team captain for Sweden as yep. well. You've yeah. just got a laundry list that you just went through. You must be on top of the world. Yeah, these two weeks have been amazing. Like, first top eight in Dallas last week, and uh, and now also winning this thing is like unreal. <laughs> Came in here with 23 points, and now I'm like, I don't even know even how many. Uh, you don't yeah. you don't need points anymore. No. <laughs> now no, you're just good. locked for everything. <laughs> yeah. what, what about being the captain of, of Sweden? How high does that rank for you on your magic accomplishments? It feels pretty great. Um, yeah, it's just, I don't know what to say even. It feels great. Like, I knew uh, yesterday after the three last rounds that I was going to be captain. So I was pretty happy about that. I also locked gold then with the same match as I locked captain. It seems so far away. <laughs> yeah, I felt it? great. I'm like, okay, I locked gold, I'm captain, I'm ecstatic. And some guy came up to me and like, you know, you only have one match for top eight, right? I'm like, do I? <laughs> like, okay, I'll go with it then. Yeah, this is what happened. Now, what about the deck? Um, who did you work with to get to the point of playing this mono red deck and what, what are your thoughts on the deck overall? Uh, Team Tamo, once again, wins the Pro Tour uh, with mono red. So that's the guys I tested with, we're a lot of people and uh, we had a really great testing. Uh, the force of the deck was uh, entirely a metagame choice. Uh, as Sam Black said very well in his interview that we have these two new great cards in Firecraft and Abbott, but we have this old card which is insane right now because everybody's playing the random creatures with two toughness. So, Searing Blood is like exactly what the deck wants. It's tempo, almost a two for one <laughs> in the same card, and like yeah. It's... So I'm curious about a couple of the other inclusions in your deck. You sure. played four copies of Lightning Berserker yes. and three Fire Drinker Satyrs. Those were somewhat unusual um, one drop choices compared to what some of the other teams played. Tell us about those. Uh, I think we expected more green decks, which those are great against. I mean, there were uh, a lot of green decks, I guess, but we didn't expect as many red decks as there were. They were like the second uh, 
think the second place in the meta game, second highest deck. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's why we included those. I mean, you could just see some of my games where Siege Trino has been traded against Sliding Berserk. Yeah. You feel pretty good. Like, Thunderbreak so, yeah. Regent. Thunderbreak Regent, that's yep. all. Yeah, it's also pretty good in the mono red mirror, actually, Lightning Berserk. Because mm -hmm. people have always had to respect it. And if they don't play perfect, they, they lose because of it. So. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. the World Championship. Yep. Focused? I'm <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I haven't <laughs> Maybe really gotten to that point. No, no, no. Uh, yeah, I think it's going to be great. We actually have four people from our team who's qualified. We have me, uh, Minus Lantu, the yep. Mox champion. Martin Miller, captain of the Danish team that won. The and we have Martin Dine, also Pro Tour champion from the last Pro Tour. So we're four people, so I'm feeling pretty good about that. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I'm sure you're going to look forward to that. We're going to look forward to see you in there as well, Joel Larson. Congratulations once again. You're our champion yep. here Finally. in Vancouver. Finally, I get to win something. You won something. <laughs> <I had laughs> you chose the right one. Second at the Grand Prix, second at the Pro Tour, but finally I go all the way. Uh, that's great. fantastic. And you're a young man still with a bright career ahead of you too. Um, fantastic start and great stuff. Congratulations once again. Thank you a bunch. Yep. All right. Well, that will do it here from Vancouver. Of course, we want to thank everybody that helps make these tournaments possible. The judges, the staff, you know, everybody that on the coverage crew that makes this stuff go. We want to thank all the players for coming out and giving us such a great show. It wouldn't be anything without the players. We love the players and uh, it's fantastic <laughs> as well. There was 393 of them. We love every single one of them. We, of course, want to thank you as well, the viewer, for spending the weekend with us. We love it that we get to bring you all the awesome magic action that we love, and we get to bring it to your screens and you know, hang out with you for the weekend as well. That's going to do it for this time. Don't forget the uh, World Championship upcoming in about four weeks from Seattle. You're not going to want to miss that. He's going to be in it. And, uh, of course, 23 other players, some of the best in the whole world. He's going to be in it. <laughs> so half of the people at this desk will be in the World Championship. You're not going to miss it. Please join us there. But until then, we'll see you next time.